All right. Take your Bibles, Luke chapter 2, if you turn there, Luke chapter 2. I'm excited for the opportunity tonight, and I'm also, uh, my friend, uh, Brother Treadway, is also helping to get me very fearful tonight. Um, the, uh, he pointed out, not only do I have to sit and uh, preach to Brother Howell right in front of me and Brother Treadway right in front of me, Pastor Willett's here tonight, too. I got the trifecta. So if I just crumble and drop into a fetal position, you know what happened, all right. Um, this morning at staff meeting, Pastor Howell, um, you know, he, he's taken from Pastor Willette that all he tries to teach us something in staff meeting and help us and uh, help us with our thinking and how we work with people. And he was talking about defending yourself and uh, chasing different things and said that he tries not to do it. That the only time that he ever stands up for himself when it's a character problem and his character is attacked. Now, I, I normally wouldn't do this from the pulpit, but from this very pulpit a couple weeks ago, if you remember, my character got attacked. Um, Brother Howell... <laughs> Brother Howell said that I tried to shoot him in the woods. Does anybody remember him saying that? Okay, Brother Howell remembers it. Amen. So I feel need to, to take a stand because I was falsely accused. And you can be the jury and decide and hear the whole story because you got about this much of it. You see, um, we just got finished with hunting uh, thing. And this has, by the way, this has to do with my character. It has nothing to do with the sermon tonight. But I was, um, I, I as a good friend, uh, took him hunting. He hadn't been. Set him up in the best spot there was in the woods. I gave him the good spot. I went down the gully about 150 yards away and set up down below him there and could see him very well. And, you know, and he was truthful. We started, I got, I got up about four in the morning, went out in the woods. It was about 30 degrees, freezing cold. He was bundled up and sat out there from six, seven, eight, nine, and probably right around 10 o'clock, was it or so, between nine and 10? It's my story, all right, that's good. I can tell it however I want. I'm just trying to be truthful here. All of a sudden, I saw what was in that area, it was state land, the biggest deer I've ever seen on that state land. Not the biggest deer I've ever seen, but the biggest deer I've ever seen on state land. Huge buck, at least 12 points. And I was just like, oh, and I saw it and I said, man, I can't believe I gave Pastor Howell my spot because he walked within 20 feet of Pastor Howell. And I'm sitting here looking and I, I, I'm like, why doesn't he shoot him? And I wanted to try to get his attention so he could shoot him. And then I realized that that deer walked right past him and he was sleepy. <laughs> he was gone. And I couldn't shoot him even though I had a straight, clear target because I was afraid I'd shoot Pastor Howell. So I followed the deer. He came down through the gully and was in a thicket. And I, there was nothing I could do. The deer started to leave the thicket. It was going to be where I didn't have any shot on him. So I tried to shoot him in the thicket. And Brother Leteski, you know I'm popping poplar like it's gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so uh, I tried to hit him in, in the midst of that poplar, and I started snapping trees and didn't get him, uh, was hoping that I would. But he was at that point about 100 yards away from Pastor Howell, not in the direction of Pastor Howell. So you can take his story and my story and see who's telling the truth, but I'd like to say I didn't try to shoot Pastor Howell. I have it other times, but not that time. All right. <laughs> Take your Bibles, if you would. Luke chapter 2. I, Pastor Howell has been uh, preaching on a little bit of spiritual warfare. And he's been in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, one of my favorite passages on dealing with battles of the mind and strongholds. And uh, you don't have to turn there, but in verse 5, it says, Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's interesting, but it uses the word obedience there. 
and we cast it down, and uh, we, the way we do that is through obedience to Christ. As he said that and was speaking on that the, the last couple weeks, I was reading, finishing up my Bible, uh, reading in 90 days, and as I was coming down to the end there, I, I was in Luke chapter 2, and it interested me that there was obedience in the Christmas story. Obedience isn't a very popular word these days. We work on a lot of relativity. We work on a lot of how we feel. And there's a lot of situational ethics that we play. Yet when we look in Luke chapter 2, we're going to see many areas where if obedience hadn't been fulfilled, then the Christmas story itself wouldn't have been fulfilled. God used some different players in there working, and they had to obey and go through a lot of things. So real quick, we're going to read Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story here, and then we'll get into the message. Um, The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, then to Judea, Judea, and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. Let's pray. Lord. I need you tonight, and I pray that you give me clearness of mind and clearness of speech. Lord, help me to say that, what you want me to. Lord, I pray that our hearts would learn from uh, the people in the Christmas story of how they obeyed your direction and your guidance. Lord, we sure do love you. God, and direct us now in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I want you to notice is that Joseph and Mary obeyed the commandment of taxes. Here we see that there came a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed and all went to be taxed into their own city and Joseph uh, rose from Galilee and went into uh, out of the city of Nazareth and they went down to Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David and so they obeyed and went where they were supposed to. The first thing I want you to notice about this obedience is they were following a man's commandment. They were following a man's commandment. Not only was it a man's commandment, it was government commandments. You know, one of the things that I see often is that we make um, rules very relative in our life. We pick and choose which ones we follow and we brag about what we follow and we complain about the ones we don't. You know, how many times do we, like with the speed limit, How many times do we take, and I can't believe that it's that. By the way, I love the fact that it's 75 now. Once you get north of Bay City, isn't that awesome? But the fact is, is we take and we make a lot of things relative. Here we see a commandment that was given them, and it was by a man. We have trouble following commandments that are given to us by men. 
Often we say, why did Pastor uh, Howell, why, why is he pushing this? And why is he doing it this way? And, uh, you know, why, why, why is he doing this through COVID? Well, maybe because he prayed about it and the Lord told him to. But often in our mind frame, we struggle with following things. Well, if God didn't tell me to do it, I, I, I shouldn't have to. No man can tell me what to do. Generally, people who operate that way um, don't have a lot of people who like them. It's just the way it goes. You know, the fact is, is we have to realize that God put people over us. We can go through a lot of scripture telling us where God put government over us. Uh, God put taxes over us. Pay unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and that. Could you imagine what some of us, if we we're in that position, I can't believe we got to go all the way over to Bethlehem. You know, the donkey, it's been struggling lately and it blew a shoe. And man, I, we got to go all the way across town and go all the way over there just to pay taxes. Who came up with? this. I tell you what, we're just going to take a stand and not do it. You know, and we'll often blame, you know, our spirituality on why we don't obey. I, when I was in Bible college, I stopped at a church in Indianapolis. I'm sure Pastor Willette would uh, know it, but it was a very large church, about this size. And they, they had decided that all government was bad. And this was at the time when um, the first George Bush was the president. And um, the, the entire Wednesday night message that I had stopped for was preaching against and calling him King George and how terrible he was. And I walked out of there, called my dad and said, I just heard a bunch of fluff. It didn't teach me anything. It taught me how to rebel against government the entire message. You know what? He, he was not recognizing the things that God teaches us. You know, God puts people in our life to follow. Children, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. God's put uh, parents so you can obey them. You say, but they're idiots. So were mine, okay? Now, you know, the fact is, is we have to do what the Bible says. And no matter what the circumstances were, they had to follow. Which leads us to our second point of that is, it was a hard commandment to obey because of the circumstances. They had to go into a crowded city with a pregnant lady. You know, traveling's not easy. Traveling pregnant's not easy at all, especially they tell us not to travel when the babies do. They won't let you get on an airplane. They won't let you do those things. Yet here we see that they had these great circumstances. You know, often we face a lot of things and we practice situational ethics. Well, I don't have to obey because this is happening. I don't have to do this because this is happening. You know, uh, I have seen more people make excuses and use COVID as the excuse for what they should do. And I would honor it if they were consistent about it. But often we make excuses and say, oh, I can't do this. You know, it's interesting because it leads us to the third part of this. It was an unusual commandment that fulfilled God's will. If you look back at Matthew chapter 5 with me. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 2, verse 5. Let's look at uh, verse 4. It says, And when he had gathered all the chief uh, priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Do you know why they had to go to Bethlehem? And the reason wasn't to pay taxes. God needed them there to fulfill prophecy. And it was there they were fulfilling God's will. You know, often we take and we'll stand up against man and say, well, I just showed them, and no man tells me what to do. And God's just using that man to get us to where we need to be. I, I will tell you, I, I have taken, and I had a heathen boss, okay? It wasn't my former boss, Pastor Willette. It was a former boss before him. But I had a heathen boss that was just terrible. But you know what? The Lord used him in a great way while I was in Bible college. The Lord used him uh, to help me in many different ways. One, I was able to pay my school bill. And the fact is, is I, I had to learn that no matter how loud he got or how crazy he got or how much he threw stuff, that I just needed to obey him. 
And we have to come to a point where we recognize this and recognize that it is not our job to stand up and to fight everything around us. We just need to obey. A licensed pilot was uh, flying his private plane. He had just gotten his license, and he wasn't very experienced in instrument landing. And as he was coming down, it was cloudy and it was rough. And uh, when the control tower was trying to bring him in, he began to get panicky, and he began to argue uh, with flight control. And all of a sudden, a stern voice came over the radio and said, You just obey the instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. You know, here Joseph and Mary had to face traveling when she was pregnant, traveling battles, but they were told to go pay their taxes, so they went and paid their taxes. It was an obstruction that was there, but God knew and God had a way. And another thing that was a pain there was they got there and there was no place for them to stay. But God had a way, again, to fulfill prophecy. So many times in our life, we need to take and recognize that even though we're hitting obstructions, we're hitting battles, we're hitting struggles, we're hitting troubles, we've got to sit back and say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to see what God is doing and I'm just going to obey. A uh, saying that uh, was often uh, pounded into my head when I was younger was, it's never right to do wrong in order to accomplish right. You just have to do right. You just have to obey. You just have to do what you're supposed to do. The second thing we see here, the second illustration, is the shepherds. You know, if you look with me in verse 9 of chapter 2 here, it says, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. One of the biggest things that stands in the way of our obedience and stands in the way of us fulfilling God's will is fear. It's very hard for us to practice faith when fear is in its place. And we have to take and recognize when fear is making us do something other than follow our God and what he wants us to do. Can you imagine what it was like for these shepherds out in the field? And they're just about their business and all of a sudden there comes and an angel's in the sky. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And it, it lights up. They got scared. The other day I... Well, it was about 6.30 in the morning, Wednesday morning. My wife was down in Detroit picking up Jordan from uh, coming in from West Coast uh, Baptist College. And I was brining a turkey, getting ready for Thursday. And I was just about my business all by myself. And all of a sudden, I heard right behind me, Hey, Dad. Now, there's not supposed to be any kids at my house. And it wasn't a boy voice. And my daughter decided, uh, her and Blake decided to drive from Oklahoma and surprise me and didn't tell me they were coming. And she said she was so glad that I wasn't sleeping because she would not have walked in the bedroom because she would have got shot. <laughs> but I did not have a gun on me uh, sitting in the, uh, in the kitchen there. And she walks in and says, hey, you know what I did? I grabbed the nearest thing I had, which was a knife, and turned around real fast. I was scared. My heart was pumping scared me. But can you imagine how it was with these shepherds? Can you imagine the skies lit up and everything's there and they got fearful? First observation of this is fear often keeps us from hearing the message of the Lord. Fear often stands in the way because we get so scared and so frustrated. Often I, I will talk to somebody who is going through a really hard time in their mind. The devil's running space in their mind and uh, they're living in fear. And I'll go through and have about 20 minutes and realize that they're really not there. And I'll stop and I'll say, what did we just talk about? And they'll stop and I'll say, I'm sorry, preacher, I... I just really don't remember anything we just talked about. You know why? Because they couldn't hear the message because fear was standing in the way. In our lives, we have lots of different types of fear. There's um, mysophobia. Does anybody know what that is? It's fear of dirt. Hydrophobia. It's fear of water. 
Uh, Nyclophobia is the fear of darkness. Acrophobia is the fear of high places. Taxophobia is the fear of being buried alive. Xenophobia is the fear of strangers. Necrophobia is the fear of death. Claustrophobia is the fear of confined places. And let's see if I can say this. Trick said decaphobia is the fear of the number 13. You know, there's a lot of things that we fear in life. Bible says God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but that of power and of love and of a sound mind. And we often struggle with power, love, and a sound mind because we're allowing fear to control our life. Could you imagine if the shepherds could not have obeyed what the angel said and said, fear not, stop, pull it together. Come on, let's focus here. I got some good news for you. They would have missed out on what God had for them. They would have, and many times in our life, we are missing out because we can't even hear the message because our head's stuck. How many times do you sit in the pew and you can't hear the message that's being taught? Many times I'll be counseling somebody or helping somebody and I'm sitting there thinking, man, this message is exactly what they need. It's what they've been struggling with. Praise the Lord. Pastor Howell is just laying it out and he's preaching away on it. And I'm a man that I hope they're listening. And afterwards I go up and say, hey, did you learn anything today? And they said, when? But it is sad that often we're renting space somewhere else than hearing the message that God has for us. How many times in your Bible reading do you do your three chapters and out, and if somebody came up and said, what did God do for you this morning? You can't tell them. How many times are you scared and frustrated and you think like there's no hope and there's nothing that can be done, yet you, didn't, you failed to recognize the hand of God that's been working all day in your life. You know, we have to come to the point where we are listening and hearing the message that the Lord has for us. The, um, sorry, uh, the next thing is the fear often keeps us from obeying the message of the Lord. So first, we don't hear it. Second, it, we can't obey it. Because we often are fearful that if we step out by faith and do what God wants us to do, then it's obstructed. A missions director once met with a mother of one of his agency's missionaries and spent some time getting to know her. She prepared tea for the director in her parlor. As they drank the tea, she explained to him the difficulty of having a daughter on the mission field in China and a son as a missionary in Sudan. Sounds like a pretty good mother, doesn't it? She loved and missed them dearly, but as she explained, her love for God allowed her to let them follow his will for their lives, not her will. The mother went on to describe the burden her son had for the Sudanese people. Her relay of his description of the people brought her to tears several times during the conversation. The mission director left her house with a deeper appreciation for the parents of missionaries and a greater burden for the country of Sudan. A few months later, the missions director got word that a missionary in Sudan had been killed. It was the Scottish lady's son. Feeling he should have be the one to break the news to her, he once again visited that mother in her home. After telling her the tragic news, the mother looked down. In a few moments of composure, she said, Sir, I would rather have my son die in the middle of Sudan alone than to have him living here with me, disobeying God's will. Do you take and look to seek to fulfill God's will? Do you in your life take and say, uh, what's most important for me is to me, is to live for Christ, to die is gain. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Where is your mind frame? Is it I want to please and serve my God and fulfill the message of God and obey God and do whatever he wants? Or do we allow fear to stand in the way and not allow us to accomplish 
what God has for us. Do you give your children to God? Do you say, God, whatever you want them to do, that's what we'll do. Do you give your time to God and say, God, wherever you want me, that's what we'll do. Most of the time, we have struggle obeying and putting faith into place because we allow fear to reign. The last thing I want you to see is the shepherds obeyed and followed then the message of the Lord. They put their obedience into action. They talked amongst themselves first about what they should do. If you look with me in verse 15, it says, And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. You know, they, they came together and they said, hey, what should we do here? You know, what's great is when Christians allow iron to sharpen iron. What's great is when Christians say, hey, are we obeying God? I love getting on um, my Bible app in the morning and seeing all the people who uh, beat me and get, get there before I do. And it's pretty early. It's usually about 6.37 in the morning. And there's a bunch of y'all who are on the Bible, reading the Bible, and posting your favorite verses that touched your heart. You know what? It's exciting. It encourages me. You know, it sharpens. We, as a church, need to get excited and say, what does the Lord want us to do? And go for it and then grab others. And communicate it. We need to work together to say, how are we going to obey God as a church? How are we going to obey God as a family? How are we going to obey God and change Saginaw for God? The second thing we see here is they move together in haste to obey the message of the Lord. You know, they didn't wait around. It actually uses the word in verse 16, and they came with haste and found the child. You know, the king's work requires haste. It is important that we get excited about what God wants us to, to do and move with haste together to accomplish it. You know, Pastor Howell had the burden for let's do the TV program and we think God will use it. And we've been putting the sermons on TV and a lot of people have gotten saved. A lot of people have actually come to church here because of it. And it was neat to see that there were many church members who moved with haste and said, hey, let me support that. Hey, let me invest in that. You know, you'll have to answer to God for that one day. Your obedience was amazing with that. Can you imagine what we could do in Saginaw if we'll all come together and obey the commandments of the Lord and just serve God and do something great for him? The last thing we see is that they shared the message of the Lord with everyone else. We see in verse uh, 17, it says, And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. You know, we're given the commandment of go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're given the commandment to spread the gospel. I had fun today. I got to drive the young fishermen um, out soul winning. And it was neat to see how excited they were. They knocked on over 90 doors and saw two people saved. And that, that is exciting. But question for you, when was the last time you saw someone saved? Think about that. You say, well, pastor, it's hard. We, we don't have our regular so many times. Maybe it's really hard with COVID and it's really hard with this or that. But you know what? People are dying. People need salvation. And one of the biggest places of obedience that we have to remember, and I have to remind myself daily, is that my job is to win souls to Christ. My job is to give the good news. My, God, my job is to share my God with others. My job is to go and spread the gospel everywhere I can. You know, if everybody at Starbucks doesn't know who I am and that I'm from First Baptist Church and they haven't gotten the gospel from me, I'm not doing my job. You say, oh, we're supposed to do it at Starbucks? No, I'm supposed to do it at Starbucks, all right? But that's, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to spread the gospel. Do you take and do you go out and let everybody know the good news? Here, the shepherds, they went and spread the good news. 
the great tidings that Christ was born and that he was going to be the Savior of the world. Are you spreading the good news? Are you obeying God and doing your job to fulfill the Great Commission? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts. We often fight battles with this obedience thing. Lord, I pray that not only would we fulfill your will in taking and following the men that you've put over us, and then taking and following your message, that we'll also follow your commission and spread the good news about. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, who would say, Pastor Scott, as you spoke tonight, I realize there's some areas of obedience that need fixing in my life. Pray for me. Would you raise your hands tonight? Amen. 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 Who else? There's some areas of obedience that need some fixing. Pray for me. Who else? All right. Let me ask you this. We ended with spreading the good news. Is there anybody here who would say, you know, I haven't been spreading the good news the way I should be right now. Maybe I did before COVID hit, but I've kind of been hindered in that. And I need to start spreading the good news in one way or another again. And I'm going to commit to God today to start spreading the good news. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand tonight? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Who else? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us. Help us to spread the gospel. Help us to spread your good news. Also, help us to obey your word. Be with this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.